Lanier, one of the founders of PGP Incorporated, the principal crypto consultant at Network Associates, the director of technology at uh, Deloitte Crypto Research and Development. He's the executive director of the Crypto Rights Foundation, I do believe, and the chief security officer at Meconomy. And he's here to talk to you today about what PGP and crypto are, how to use them, and how not to use them. Hey, everybody. So, thanks for being patient. Appreciate that. Okay, so this is the newbie track, right? Which I think is, is kind of silly because, in fact, all the stuff that I'm going to tell you is stuff that so-called experts are completely fucking clueless about. Okay? This is like the really dumb shit that everybody gets wrong regardless of whether they think they're an expert or not. So, totally do not think you're in a newbie thing right now. Think, think of yourselves as beginning on the road if you are, or like learning how to do things right if you've already been using PGP a little bit. Um, my introducer was very kind in introducing me with all these past you know, things that I've done. Right now I'm the Chief Security Officer at Meconomy Incorporated. We're hiring! <coughs> See you later. Um, okay, so really quickly, um, except for the two guys in the back who were shoulder surfing me while I was doing this about 10 minutes ago, uh, the rest of you um, don't know what the worst assumption is that you can make when you're using a communication system. So except for those two guys back there, does anybody want to like hazard a guess? Uh, you were all shoulder surfing. Okay, <laughs> exactly. Uh, oh, it's on autopilot. No wonder. <laughs> See? Okay. This is perfect. Okay? Look, I don't really hate PowerPoint. <laughs> this is why. Okay? All right. So let me go backwards a little better. Um, so, yeah. Assume you're Shakur. Beautiful. I love this. This is great. Okay. Hilariously funny. Um, please take that seriously because it is absolutely the worst thing you can possibly do. I've seen this mistake made literally thousands of times in every kind of expert and uh, not expert. Stop! Okay, somehow this stupid thing is on autopilot. Okay. I hate this program. I really do. What the fuck? Alright, somebody who has a clue, tell me like where the autopilot thing is. Slides, slideshow? Slideshow. Alright. No, it's still going to be on autopilot. Look, I really fucking care. Yeah, I'll just talk really fast. Yeah, okay, that's a good idea. That's a good solution. Okay, four bad habits. Worst assumption, key mismanagement, bad etiquette, advanced screw-ups. Uh, first thing, you all know this one already. Don't worry about it. It's like, you're going to make this mistake anyway, so, you know, ha. Huh. All right, second thing is... Yeah, no, for real, for real. No, seriously, I'll, I'll take that criticism. I am so proud that I don't know how to use Microsoft PowerPoint. In every environment that I've ever been in, in every environment I've ever been in, I've always told people, do not fuck with me with your 125 slide PowerPoint presentations, because I don't want to see it. I like ASCII test, uh, text, put it out, email to me, whatever, you know, I don't care. So all the fancy crap, you know, it's like useless. All right, so these are the uh, key mismanagement mistakes that everybody will make. And you'll excuse me, but I'm just going to use this like simplified view here, because I'm too fucking stupid to use the actual program. So first thing is, now this seems really obvious, doesn't it? Don't forget your passphrase. All right, now, truth time here, ready? How many people in this room use PGP? Okay, everybody who has never forgotten their passphrase, lower your hand. Yeah, right, my ass. <laughs> you guys are lying. Okay, uh, well, let me just put it to you this way. Um, passphrase selection is the most important thing you'll ever do because your entire interface with PGP and probably every other crypto or security system you use will be through your passphrase. And if it's too complicated, you'll do what 98% of people do, which is forget it in the first two hours. Uh, seriously, uh, I've trained certain you know, marketing executives who are really cool for the first five minutes and then like 10 minutes later they come back and they go, I can't remember my passphrase. And this has happened many times. Even at PGP Incorporated, we had a VP of marketing who should remain nameless who was just could never ever use the program. 
I mean, the entire time she was there. Um, second thing uh, about forgetting your passphrase is it's great to make it complicated. It's, you know, it's really cool if it's 25 characters long. It's great if it's multiple words. It's nice if it has punctuation. Excellent if it's case sensitive. Numbers, we love it. It's all good. But if you can't remember it, all that stuff is really wasted on the NSA. So, um, and it's, it certainly it doesn't do anybody else any good. So I'll get into why it's bad to forget your passphrase later on. But let's just say that you lose all the functionality of the application if you do that. So it's kind of, you know, don't bother with that. Um, the next most common thing that people do is to lose their keys. Now, I know you're all sitting there going, Dave, this is so obvious. Well, I'm sorry to have to stand here in front of a room of really intelligent people and say really obvious things, but six years ago, when I co-founded with a bunch of other people, the PGP help team, we do freeware help for people. Uh, you can find it at cryptorights.org slash pgp dash help dash team slash hello dot html, because we're really friendly. Um, when we started this six years ago, you know, we thought, well, we're going to be dealing with people who have really hardcore questions. But in fact, it's been about six years of, I lost my key. I forgot my passphrase. All right, to the point where, you know, we put that pretty high up in the fact, you know, um, about how we can't help you in this case. You know, we're sorry if you stubbed your toe, but don't walk there. Um, so losing your key pair. There are some really easy things that you can do to prevent this from being a problem. Now, of course, it won't do you any good at all if you can't remember the passphrase to the keys that you've backed up. But there's a really useful thing that you can do. And I will tell you right now, a lot of really expert PGP users, including members of the PGP development team, who I will not name right now, have fallen prey to this second mistake of losing their keys. And here's the easy way to deal with it. Anybody here have a floppy disk? Hello? Use it. Just back up your key pairs on the floppy disk. Now, if you want to be paranoid, you know, like me, you first save your key pairs into a directory, and then you zip or tar or stuff that directory, whatever makes you, you know, happy. And then you take that directory and you encrypt it. Here's the tricky part. You can't encrypt that directory to your public key, right? Anybody want to tell me why? Really, seriously, somebody raise your hand. Tell me why. Come on, you can tell me. Okay, well, for those of you who can't guess, it's because if you lose the keys, you then can't decrypt that archive. So you encrypt it to a conventional passphrase. PGP does both types of encryption, right? You can encrypt something just as a blob with a, a symmetrical passphrase to it. Or you can do the public key thing, which is really intended for sending it to other people. But for yourself, you can encrypt it to a symmetric passphrase. And of course, that should not be the same one that you use for anything else. because. If you can't remember those passphrases, you won't be able to remember this one. So make it a special one, okay? Whatever it takes. Your mom's maiden name, your birthday, your dog's name, I don't care. As long as you can remember it, you know? I don't advocate doing stupid things like that, using those particular types of passphrases, but, you know, if that's what it takes, then do it. The end result is you'll end up with this blob on a floppy or a removable or, you know, an MO or a zip cartridge or a CD or whatever. It doesn't really matter to me, you know. Uh, CDR is great. I love them. CDRWs are even better. And someday when you do lose your keys, which you will do, then you'll be able to recover it. Now, the last thing that I wanted to mention is when you do this whole backup procedure, which I refer to as self-escrow, and don't give me a hassle about the name because this is a good form of escrow. Anybody guess what I'm going to say next? Sorry? Don't lose the backup copy? Well, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll take that one. That's like 4B, okay. But anybody want to tell me what number 5 is? No, no. Test your backup. It really makes no difference if you've got this super slick backup the NSA can't get into, if you can't get into it, right? So, 
This is all obvious, you know. I'm giving you the obvious stuff here, but believe me, this is like common mistakes everybody makes, and that's why this is called how not to use PGP. Um, the other thing you can do, and this is a really cool thing to learn how to do, is you can generate what we call a KRC, or a Key Revocation Certificate, which is the next item down here on Key Revocations, which means that if you should need to re revoke this key pair, which means you sort of terminate use of the secret key, and you can still use the secret key for decryption and signing, or for uh, decryption, um, but your public key is sort of tagged as being don't use this anymore to anybody else in the public, this is a very good thing to do, okay? If you suspect the key's been compromised, or if you lose the passphrase, you have a key revocation certificate, which you can then put out into the public domain, which will mean that for the rest of eternity, because I know a lot of people don't put expiry dates on their keys, people won't be able to encrypt things to this key, which will be kind of frustrating because you'll get all these encrypted messages and you'll have to send back this embarrassed message. <laughs> Sorry, I've been like a PGP extra for 10 years, but I can't decrypt this message because I lost my key. And they'll go, right, okay. I don't think I'm going to hire Dave for that job, right? Had a question? Does no. Well, it does the first time when you make it. But if you store it just as a file, then it doesn't require a passphrase to throw it up on a key server somewhere. Good question. That was actually a good question. Okay. Um, another thing that people very commonly do. Now, this is, uh, I've got to say, um, Phil Zimmerman, a buddy of mine, great guy. Is, has actually not made these mistakes. As far as I know, Phil, myself, John Callis, and maybe four other individuals in my entire life have not made any of these mistakes. I've never lost a key. I've never forgotten a passphrase. I'll tell you why I never forget a passphrase, because I, I promised I'd get back to that, right? So I will. Um, but almost everybody else that I know, and that amounts to literally thousands of people who represent thousands of keys on my key rings, and yes, my key rings are very large and unwieldy and it's a real problem, and yes, I'm a great beta test case, um, have made these mistakes. So I've ended up literally doing key management for other people on my key ring for them. And that's really kind of sad, especially when they're like, you know, in charge of working groups in the IETF and stuff. Um, Losing Web of Trust connections. Let me summarize here by saying, if you have an old key, and for whatever reason, you don't want to use it anymore, maybe you change email addresses and you're too dumb to know that you can add a second user ID, you know, and like not use the first one, um, which is another thing that people don't figure out, but I didn't even put it on here because that was just like too easy. Uh, if, if that ever happens and you don't want to use that key anymore, and you want to generate a new key, which is a perfectly acceptable thing to do, you've accumulated signatures on the first key, presumably. Anybody here uh, familiar with the web of trust? Raise your hands, please. Okay. I'm going to go into a little web of trust discussion here for a minute for people who are not familiar with it, because that's an important part of why PGP is so cool. But the point that I'm making here is that you can easily lose these web of trust connections, which are really vital to the presence of your key in the worldwide PGP community, and meaningful to you, useful to you, and to other people who would use your key, because it establishes the validity of your key. Um, if you lose those connections, it's sort of a stupid user trick, you know, it's like really not a good thing to do. So the way to get around that is you take the old key, this is good key hygiene, you take the old key, you sign the new key with the old key. So it says, remember that old key that all of you trusted that has like your signatures on it? That key signed this key and asserts that I am now the new Dave Del Torto or whoever. And then you can accumulate new web of trust on the new key and people who sign the old one can easily go and say, oh yeah, Dave signed this new one. I don't need to call him up at four in the morning to check his fingerprint. I'll just sign the new one you know, for a limited amount of time and then next time I see him at an IETF meeting, I'll say, hey Dave, was that really your key? And I'll say, yeah, and they'll go, cool. Really easy. Um, if, if you do that, it really smooths things over. You would be surprised how few people do this. They just generate a new key and bam, they start from square zero after like five years of PGP use, which is really dumb. It's like ripping a hole in the web of trust. Now, let me explain the web of trust briefly because it's kind of important. There are two concepts that people generally don't understand about PGP, including expert users. You're about to leapfrog right over their heads because I'm going to explain it. Validity, trust. Two different things. 
validity is a really simple thing. It's very objective. Do you believe that that cryptographic object, that key, that public key, actually belongs to the individual who claims to own it? If you do, the key is valid, and you express that belief by signing it with your key and asserting the validity of that key belonging to that person. Is anybody here not clear on what I've just said? Because if you're not, please raise your hand. You're not dumb for asking a question about this. This is like really arcane for some reason. Okay? Okay. Validity of a key is the belief that the key material, the key material, is bound to the real live person. The reason that this is so important, the whole world of digital signatures, which are about to become like legal you know, uh, artifacts, is based on whether you believe the cryptographic key material really belongs to the human being who asserts that they signed that digital document. If there's no validity, the signature is worthless. Right? Um, everybody here heard of Jim Bell? Cypherpunk got thrown in jail, bomb threats, federal court building, blah, 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 mumble, mumble. Okay? Federal prosecutor calls me up. Says, federal investigator just called me, said, Dave, you, you do that training course at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center, right? Yeah. So, will you come and testify in court about this guy Jim Bell and how he sent these threatening emails and posted them in news groups and on mailing lists and stuff? And I said, no. He said, why? I said, he said, he said is it because you're a cypherpunk and you think all federal agents are assholes or something? And I said, no, absolutely not. I teach them. You know, they're, they're just people like us. <laughs> well, that's what I said anyway. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so he goes, well, why won't you testify? And I said, well, because the private key was posted to like mailing lists and Usenet and stuff, you know, months beforehand. So in fact, I could have made the signatures on those surrounding documents. And so he sucks in when he goes, oh. And then of course he goes in and he does it in court anyway, asserting this thing, right? Which is completely bogus. So you live, you learn. Anyway, that's validity. You believe that the key material is bound to the human being. Question. Excellent question. How do you know that? Oh, God, you guys are good. Okay. Um, you know that because you check it with them. Right? Ideally, what you do, if, if you're like really careful like me, and by the way, the reason that you'll see trusted introducer signatures on my key is because people know that I'm really anal retentive, asshole, you know, paranoid fucker about making sure that people really are who they say they are before I sign their key. You will not see my signature on a key of somebody else unless I've checked at least two forms of ID, photo ID. I know them for a certain amount of time, depending on the gravity of the signature being requested. And most importantly, I have a reason to sign their key. Like we're working on a project together, or we work in the same company, or something like that. You know, or it's like a really old close friend of mine, or we're writing an ETF draft together, or something. You know, there's some reason. I don't just sign a key for the hell of it. It's not a popularity contest. You're making an assertion in cypherspace, which will someday become a very important legal assertion. Okay? You have to tread carefully here. Do not lightly assert validity. It's not a simple thing. It's objective, but that doesn't make it unimportant. Okay? I see a question. Okay, that, that's an interesting question. Everybody hear that question? The question is, why would I sign somebody's key? What, what, what would it profit me or what would it profit them for me to do that? Um, it's so simple. I mean, it, 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 it's, it would literally profit me because I might work for that person or that person might work for me. I simply won't send them anything sensitive unless I trust that the key that I'm encrypting to is bound to the person that I want to be able to read that message or get that file. It's that basic, it really is. If you don't have validity on a key, you have no business encrypting anything to that key. It could just as well be Joe Fed or you know Sally NSA agent or whoever. Not that they're bad. Okay, but it's not the person that you think you're encrypting to. Anybody can make a key 
The user ID of which is Dave Del Toro, DDT at Crypto Rights or DDT at LSD.com. Anybody can do that. The thing that they can't do is they can't make a key that has the identical key space or key, fingerprint space, in other words, the same unique fingerprint on the key, which is part of one of the artifacts of the key properties, has the same user ID key size, that's kind of important, the size of the encryption subcomponent or the encryption subkey. So they can't duplicate something that has the same key ID, key size, and fingerprint, and most importantly, they can't get every single one of the people that I work with who signed my key like to collude as a huge group and sign that key asserting that their key, which says Dave Del Toro on it, is actually my key. It's just, you know, it's out of the, the realm of probability. It becomes unbelievable. It's like, it's not computationally infeasible, it's like human interaction socially infeasible. That's your protection. And that's what the Web of Trust is, by the way. And by the way, let me, let me just say here really quickly, the Web of Trust is a horrible name for, for this thing because it's actually a web of validity. You're asserting validity on keys, not trust. Okay, now wait, now one, one thing. The other thing I wanted to define really quickly is trust because that's a completely different thing from validity. That's subjective, right? And may I say that, you know, aside from the simple key management or key mismanagement mistakes that people commonly make, not understanding validity and trust and how they work and how the web of trust is built is like, you know, common mistake four through ten. I mean, it's just like, cumulatively, this is, if you have weaknesses in the web of trust, it's because people don't check things like fingerprints and, and make signatures carefully and don't understand about expiry and stuff like that. But I'm not going to get into a lengthy discussion of key hygiene here. I just wanted to cover the basic topics where we can go into a Q&A at the end and you can ask me anything later on. It's cool. Or email me or go to the P2P Help team thing. Um, okay, you had a question? Yeah, uh, no. It, has, it, makes, it makes no difference whether you receive someone's public key through the email encrypted or not encrypted. The fact that it arrives securely encrypted to your key is completely orthogonal to whether or not that key material is in fact bound to that human being. Okay, I got, I got the. So the question is, what, you know, what's what's wrong with man in the middle attacks? Okay, the man in the middle attack is not an issue with PGP because of the web of trust. The only reason that a man in the middle attack would be a problem is if you're stupid and you don't check the validity of the key with the person and make sure that the key that you have locally on your key ring is in fact the key that they sent you. By checking the fingerprint over the phone or in person, getting the photo, you know, the photo ID. By the way, there's like levels of, of you know, assurance on checking this stuff. Um, there's only one type of validity. You've either signed the key, you know, or not. Um, there are shadings of values in uh, versions five and, and above. Different signature types, and you know, there's non-exportable signatures that never leave your key ring, so you're not asserting something to the public, but only to yourself. You know, in other words, you're deceiving yourself, but not everybody else in the world, right? If you screw up and sign the wrong key, um, that's only a minor problem. Right? Uh, there's a, there's a trusted introducer signature, which is not only that I believe that this is in fact the individual who signed or who produced this key and sent it to me, but I also in fact trust that person, and that goes to the next thing, which is trust as opposed to validity. So that's sort of a combination type signature. There's uh, a plain old exportable signature, which is just like, yeah, I checked his ID. This is Bill so-and-so, or this is Joe Blow, or whatever, and you know, I believe it, and I believe it until this date, and then my signature expires. And then there's like this really arcane type of signature called a meta-introducer signature, which is like, I believe that key is God, and anything that that key signs is like a trusted introducer to me, and that's really only used in large enterprise environments or very complicated little PKIs like CryptoRights.org, for example. We do security work for human rights groups and human rights workers who go out in the field and deal with really dangerous situations. In those cases, if they sign a key as a meta-introducer, it has a profound impact on the entire PKI involved, the public key infrastructure involved in their work, and theoretically could result in somebody getting killed, you know, if they trust the wrong key. So, use that carefully, but basically the only kind of keys, uh, signatures that you're going to make are either non-exportable, which is very sort of um, preliminary kind of thing. I use it a lot, actually. Um, 
in that gray area between where you've checked the key with the person, but you need to send them a message. You haven't done you haven't done the check first, but you need to send a message. First of all, the content of that message should not be, you know, my bank account number is this, and you know, my blood type is such and such, and here's my DNA data and stuff like that. It should be something real simple, like, will you meet me, you know, for a face-to-face -face meeting to check your key next Tuesday at 12 at such and such burrito place? Um, now, you know, granted, that's a perfect man in the middle attack. You know, they like make somebody up, like you know, Mr. Phelps, and send him in and say, you know, yeah, hi, I'm Dave Del Toro, and then later he peels his face off and walks away. Right? Um, but you know, <laughs> let's face it, <laughs> we're not assuming we're secure here, right? Right. Yes, Dave. We're not assuming we're secure. You've got to think for yourselves. <laughs> Have I seen Life of Brian? Okay. So you're all supposed to say, we've got to think for ourselves. You know, like in unison. Okay, um, let, me, let me really quickly, before we go too far into this, let me also say that um, trust is an entirely subjective thing. Nobody can make you trust somebody else. Even PGP. There's no reason for you to trust somebody just because they have a PGP key. In fact, just because they have a PGP key and just because they sent it to you and just because you checked it and it's valid and it's really that person doesn't mean you should trust them. All it means is the key is valid. Then you have to make a subjective you know, decision in your own mind. Am I going to send this guy like really sensitive stuff just because I know it's him who's reading the stuff? It's an entirely separate thing. Um, finally, and I'll, I'll just sort of leap into the last one. I really, this seems kind of obvious as well, but too many keys. Um, uh, you, you, those of you who have PGP have probably in the past gone to the key server and looked up you know, Joe Bob at AAA.com. And you've discovered that Joe Bob has like 57 keys. Not a damn one of them has been revoked. <laughs> you can't tell whether they've been used or not. You don't really know whether they belong to him because you're sure as heck not going to check 57 different keys with Joe. And you have no idea which one to use, and therefore Joe has um, essentially committed a denial of service on himself. <laughs> Classic mistake, you know. So the way not to do that is, you know, make a few keys, use them carefully. If you have a training key at first, and I'll get to that, um, that's a good thing to do. Um, but don't flood the world with lots and lots of keys because then it begins. You know, you reach a point of diminishing returns, and now nobody wants to send you any secure stuff because they have no idea which could use them. Believe me, expert PGP users make this mistake all the time. I mean, like, I'm not exaggerating here. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a key management fanatic, okay? You can probably tell by now. Every day, I exchange email. I'm not exaggerating. Every day, I exchange email with somebody who should know better, who has, like, four keys on the server and hasn't bothered to revoke the first three and like let everybody know. You have to kind of like begin to, you know, develop ESP and look at expiration dates and creation dates on keys and say, well, this one was created the most recently. I'll try that one first. Right? And then you have to work your way back. And then, you know, of course, there's all the problems that they have with like not keeping the right user IDs on that key, so you've got to encrypt it manually, you can't use your plugins for email or whatever, and you're really not sure if it's the right one. Of course, your first message is, key ID such and such. Is this the right key for you? you know, can you read this? You know, that old ad, C-N-U-R-D-T-H-S, you know, can you read this? Right? That's really annoying. Every day that happens. Hello. Okay. Um, next. Any questions at this point? Not a question, Dave. But oh, good. Okay, let's move on. Remember that anal retentive thing? Yeah, the anal retentive thing. Okay. We can fix this little timing problem in under ten seconds to do a slide. Oh, format. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Slide layout? I don't think so. All right. Screw it, man. Don't worry about it. This is PowerPoint. Let's not have a cow. All right. So, forgetting your fast phrase. Um, keep an encrypted passphrase file. I went through this. This is important. Keep it unique. Keep it simple. I love ASCII. There's all, there's all these little passphrase management things out there, utilities and stuff. 
Okay? <laughs> I just want to laugh when I think about it because most people that I know who use those things, and I'm just, you know, I'm generalizing here, but a lot of people, they download the software, they load it with like their 10 most, you know, used passphrases, and then they don't manage to use it to maintain their passphrases anymore. They just sort of keep those there and they forget about it and it just becomes this sort of dead limb that hangs off the back of their elbow. And <clears throat> that's, that's not the intent. Keep it really simple. ASCII text files, they work great. Tab delimit them if you really must. It's really, really simple. Yes, is there a question over there? I saw a hand waving. No? Okay. All right. Um, losing your keys. Second most common to say, oh, this is priceless stuff. You know, my heart has crashed. So? You didn't have a backup of any kind? My favorite mistake, uh, my favorite excuse was, my laptop fell over the side of the platform. <laughs> Anybody here want to tell me who that was? Right How did you know? <laughs> okay. Uh, CTO of Haven Co. If anybody's curious. Good old Ryan. Ryan, where are you? Where are you, Ryan? Where's your laptop? Uh, okay, so I went through the whole self escrow thing. Escrow itself is not a bad thing. You know, it can be used properly. The whole point is you don't want a nice federal agent to come in and escrow things for you. And the reason that you're not going to have that happen is because you're smart enough to do it for yourself. Escrow uh, means reserving a, a backup of something or preserving it in a place where an intermediary can store it for you. Um, if you have a properly self-escrowed blob, that's been you know tarred and encrypted. You could store it on the net somewhere in the clear, because the passphrase is like 50 characters long, and there's no way in hell that anybody's going to get into that, unless the quantum computing guy was right, and we're all dead meat anyway. So, yeah. By the way, let me uh, let me mention here that. Um, the user ID syncing problem is a really, really big problem. I mean, if you have a new email address and PGP is your preferred method for receiving envelopes in the mail, in order for other people to be able to easily send you envelopes in the mail, you have to make sure that your address is attached to that key material. Okay? So if you put your key out in the Yellow Pages key server directory of the world, it really does people no good if there's no correlation between the address that they have for you and this key. It, it might have your name on it, but how many guys are there out there named Reverend Jim Jones? There's quite a few, right? So, synchronize. It's also important that you keep the key rings synchronized on your local machine. If your private key ring knows about a private key, but your public hearing does not have the corresponding public key complement, you do not own that key pair. You cannot do anything useful with it. You cannot sign anything with it because BGP likes to know that you have both complements. You know, both you know, those big prime numbers, there's like this prime number that big, and this prime number is that big, and you multiply them together, and then there's a modulus, and all that fancy stuff happens. Okay, you've got to have both pieces. Has everybody here heard the like two key padlock, you know, fire the missiles, two guys across the room, each with a key metaphor? Okay, you need both those keys. Um, so automation, and if you can make this statement honestly, every email address to which I expect people to encrypt has a corresponding username or user ID on my current unexpired key pair, you're all set. You're halfway there. Okay. Key revocation. Boy, I, you know, if I'd had more time, I would have added a lot to this slide. But, but the really big problem here is that people leave dead keys all over the place. It's like you just walk along and you just take keys and just toss them behind you and you forget about them, and that's really dumb. This goes to the problem of having way too many keys as well. But really, it's a problem for other people more than it's a problem for you. So it's it's really nice. It's it's good key netiquette if you don't do it, or good cryptiquette. Um, Losing web of trust, too many keys, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so bad cryptocurrency. Yes, I invented this word. Yes, I was stoned at the time. <laughs> Offering others a secure channel. This is something that people don't normally think about when they think about public key cryptography. The act of placing 
a public key in the public domain is an announcement to other people that you respect their right to privacy. Just let that sink in for a minute. This guy in the blue shirt here, you know, if he wants to send me a message, yeah, you, if you want to send me a message, right, and you've got something really important to tell me, something earth-shaking to you, and I have not provided you with a valid, unexpired key with a proper user ID on it, I am not respecting your right to privacy. I don't even know you, and I'm being an asshole to you already. And I'm not an asshole. Well, not most of the time. Um, another thing, replying to somebody in the clear. You're just an asshole if you do this. I'm sorry. <laughs> if I send you an encrypted message, you know, it's got all this important stuff, like some human rights workers are coming in from, you know, China, and we're going to meet at such and such a place. And would you like to come and hang with us and meet them so we can exchange keys and talk about the fact that their, you know, their friends are being shot to death in Tibet or something? And you reply to the message and you quote back my entire message. And you do so in the clear. What have you just done? Well, you may have killed some people in Tibet, right? But more importantly, you've demonstrated your absolute incompetence using the crypto system because you don't understand the most fundamental aspect of it, which is when you start putting an envelope around something, you keep it in that envelope. I, I, I just, you know, it's like this is such a simple concept, but so many people commit this violation. It's just not even funny. It's not funny. It's a serious thing. We do work at crypto rights, literally, where if somebody does that, we just lock them out of our PKI. Sorry, you know, like once, if it's not too serious, maybe we'll let you slide. Twice, you're out of there. We cannot trust you. We don't care if your key is valid. You cannot be trusted. And really what this is about is trusting people. But really, validity is cool. It's necessary. You shouldn't be encrypting to somebody if you don't believe their key is theirs. Trust, however, is what this is really all about. Handling other people's keys. I could write a book on this one. Um, let me make it really simple. My public key, my property, not yours. I provide it to everybody, and you provide all yours to everybody else, as a courtesy to them. It's kind of like your personal information when you go surfing. If you want to be like DoubleClick and grab people's information and spread it out to places where they don't have any control over it and they don't know what's being done with it and stuff like that, and do traffic analysis on who they know and all that kind of neat stuff you can do, fine. But that's the kind of person you are. Your karma will come back and bite you in the ass. Okay? When you handle other people's keys, do so in a totally encrypted environment. Now, so you asked a question, I believe, a little while ago about what is it, is it important to send somebody a key, you know, while when it's encrypted? If it's important to you to provide that key to them such that nobody else can look at it while it's in transit between you and their key rings, encrypt it. If you put it on a key server, it's been made public. Okay, and we'll, I'll get into a little shading there. Um, what's, what time is it? Ooh, okay, it's getting late. I want to make sure I got more time for a question and answer because there's lots of stuff to talk about here, so I'll kind of blow a little quicker. Um, so if you handle other people's keys, like for example, let's say that you and I are working on a project together, you and me, and I send you a key and it's encrypted, and you reply encrypted the way you should, and you sign my key. You do not turn around and then post my key to a public key server with your signature on it, right? It's not a popularity contest you're establishing validity for purposes of secure communication. The important thing is for me to have your signature on my key and for you to have your signature on my key so your, my key is valid on your key ring. It's not important for anybody else to see that. And it's definitely not cool for you to then turn around and fire that key off to a public key server and say, I saw David's key. You know, I really don't care. When we released PGP 5.0, when we started PGP Incorporated, we released our first GUI version. We really screwed up because it was possible 
you know, we sent out this default key ring with like all of, all of our keys on it, you know, so, like every copy of the freeware PGP that you got off of MIT, you downloaded it and it had like a whole, it was preloaded with a bunch of public keys, right? Well, you know, the nice thing about GUIs is that they're easy to use, right? The downside is that they're really easy to use <laughs> because people would go, select all, sign, send to server. Right? So, like, suddenly we started noticing, oh shit, it's like taking five minutes to download my key over a T1 line. Because it's got like 500 signatures on it. And you know what? I don't know any of those people. They've never called me to check my key. They signed it because it was part of a default key ring in a public release of freeware. Hello? All right. Enough said, huh? Okay. Okay, so you're offering a secure channel. This is a really cool thing. It's a courtesy. Replying in the clear. Lame excuses. Okay, my classic lame excuses. I send a message out to a whole bunch of people. One of them replies in the clear. Everybody else is really cool. They all encrypt the reply. One of them replies in the clear. And you know what the excuse is? I don't have keys for all those other people. Well, then you should have replied to me alone and copied everybody else with ciphertext that they couldn't open, and everybody with a clue will say, oh, you know, he didn't have my key, and they will send you their public key. So the next time, everybody will be in on a little group communication. It's a beautiful thing about PGP. You can encrypt to thousands of people, and it only increases the size of the message by a few bits, you know? 128 bits per encrypted session key. Literally, you can encrypt like a five megabyte file to thousands of people and it'll only be like, you know, five megabytes and a couple of K at the most. It's a great thing. Don't abuse it. Okay, handling other people's keys. Don't post them, sign them, return them. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about some advanced screw ups because this is like fun stuff that, you know, supposedly really expert people do. First thing, they go away from home and they either don't take their crypto with them, you know, or they like break it or lose the key while they're on the road and they can't use it. Um, Hotmail people, you know, it's cool to have a Yahoo or a Hotmail account for emergencies. Like you're on the road and you got to check your mail through a browser in, I don't know, Anguilla, British, British West Indies or something at a conference. But bring your keys with you, download a copy of the freeware, install it on whatever machine you're on. You're spreading crypto around, it's good. <laughs> um, NIM keys. I, I mean, I could talk a lot about that one, but we don't have much time, so I'm going to cut it a little short. NIM keys. If you make a key for your pseudonym, do not sign it with your real name key. <laughs> Hello? It's like, duh. And likewise, you know, <laughs> don't sign your real key. With and by the way, don't go out and ask all your friends who signed your real key to sign the NIM key because it's really me, you know. Um, that's not the point of a NIM and it's not the point of a NIM having a key. And if you're a freedom user, you should be careful with this. They make it a little bit easier, but you, should, you still have to be careful with these kinds of things. The reason that you do this is probably because it's really stupid, uh, why, why you don't do it, but also because you're then susceptible to what I call ESK traffic analysis. Encrypted session key traffic analysis. Anybody know what an encrypted session key is? It's made in every PGP message. All right, simple version. I'm standing in the middle between two large boxes, okay? There's a big box, this screen over here, and this screen over here. This screen contains all the literal data packet. It's like the encrypted blob, right? It's all encrypted with a session key. I'm now holding the session key in my hands. This is, this is visual aids. This is the session key, okay? I encrypt the session key, and I encrypt it to the public keys of all my recipients. It's 128 bits of data, right? 128 bit keys, 128 bit crypto. You've heard about it. It's very famous, 128 bits. Really powerful. Really cool. Everybody gets a copy of that encrypted session key. Over here, people go, oh, there's the key ID for my key on the encrypted session key packet. And they decrypt that, and they get the session key, and then they reconstitute the literal data. That's how PGP works. It's really elegant, it's really smart. It also means that every single PGP message that you send out 
has encrypted session keys that, tagged, that are tagged for all the recipients. Even if you encrypt it to a dim key and you mail it to a totally separate address, the person who's smart at the federal law enforcement agency you're worried about, or whatever, your business competitor, can simply look at that PGP message. If they can do traffic analysis, if they can watch your message traffic stream, they can do this. All they have to do is look at where are the encrypted session keys. To whose keys were this message encrypted? Or, you know, was this message encrypted? It's really basic, right? And you can't fake it by just sending it to MIMS and saying, well, that's actually Joe's pseudonym. You know, nobody will know. Because it's right there in the PGP packets. All they have to do is run PGP dump on and you know, you're dead. Okay, so, all right. There is a way to stealth PGP, but that's for next year. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, actually, there's some really obscure versions of PGP on the Mac that did it. And there's also stealth. Uh, you can still download it off of MIT servers, or you can get it off of what used to be replay and is now zedz.net or zedz.nl. Um, there, it's out there. If anybody wants to know where it is, let me know and I'll send it to you. Unless, of course, you're a foreign citizen, in which case, I'll send it to you and I'll tell the BXA. Question? Nonsense. Uh, it is very popular, except in nonsense, that PGP 262i or 263i or whatever is the only safe version of PGP to use. Not true. PGP 26x uses well reviewed and, and you know carefully uh, scrutinized algorithms. PGP 5.x, 6.x, and now 7.x all use the same similarly well reviewed algorithms. They've all been out there for years. The, five, the new Diffie-Hellman key form, type 4 keys, I should say, the new Diffie-Hellman keys are like currently the only type 4 keys available, are much more and more secure than the old RSA keys. For one thing, the fingerprint on the newer keys is calculated over all the key material and all the properties, whereas the fingerprint on the old RSA keys is only calculated over several specific properties. So the fingerprint alone, that, that alone makes it better. Secondly, there's a really nice advanced feature in versions 5 and above. Version 6 and above makes it easily accessible in the UI. Um, and there's an issue here that I'll get to with GPG, but, but here's the important information. In the new type 4 keys, there are subkeys. There's signing subkeys, which is your master key, which collects all your web of trust. And there are n to n plus n subkeys for encryption. You can have multiple encryption subkeys. Only one of them will be used, and therein lies the problem of interoperability between NAI's PGP and GPG, or GNU PGP, or Open PGP, um, in that GNU PGP currently is not able to recognize the right key to decrypt with or to encrypt with when it sees multiple encryption subkeys. Therefore, if you are a user of PGP 6 and above, and you have wisely chosen to have multiple encryption subkeys. For example, I have something like five or six subkeys on my main Diffie-Hellman key. Only one of them should be active at any one time. And in fact, the one that I created a really long time ago, like four or five years ago, that I didn't want to use anymore, I revoked it. You can revoke individual encryption subkeys, and I put that out on the net. So if you go download my you know, canonical key or whatever, um, you'll find, say, five subkeys for encryption, only one of which really should be active at this time, and that's the one that you should use. However, GPG still has trouble seeing it because of all the other expired or revoked ones. So what I do is I keep a web page. If anybody wants to go there, it's deltor.to. Yes, I have a domain in Tonga. Uh, deltor.to slash keys with an S slash DDT. If you go there, you will see what I think is the way to put your keys in the public, which is you totally control the manifestation of your keys, the HTML of your page is signed, so nobody can fake that. And it's on your website, so if your website is reasonably secure, it's even harder for somebody to break in and then spoof your signature on the HTML and put in the wrong key material. Multiple levels of protection. It also means you can strip off all those nasty revoked or expired subkeys, and therefore GPG users won't have a problem with your key. So the type 4 keys, um, very good. The old RSA keys, 
still okay. However, if it's a 768-bit RSA key, you may want to think twice about encrypting to it if the message is sensitive and the person works somewhere for the federal government or something like that, because that may in fact be attackable. Um, we have evidence to suggest, uh, well certainly uh, Adi Shamir has recently used hardware to break 512-bit RSA encryption. Um, so we now assume that 768 is well within the range of a well-funded adversary. And um, we also assume that 1024 is well within the theoretical grasp of somebody with a really advanced supercomputing, parallel supercomputing environment. So um, not a safe thing to do if you really, really, really are worried about the contents of the message. If it's just, you know, casual, hey, Bob, do you want to, like, meet me in the front of the NIST headquarters or outside of CIA Langley and go to the sub shop and get a, you know, a, a sub, you know, for lunch, not a big deal. Any other questions? Yes, you. You said that it's not okay to sign someone's key and then post it. I said it's not okay to sign someone's key and then post it. Generally, yes. Is it okay then for you to post a key that somebody else signed? It's a valid question. Is it okay for me to post someone else's signature on my key? Um, if they've put their signature on my key with the intent and we have an understanding that they want that to be public, yeah, sure. The important thing is it's up to me, because it's my key. Um, in the, however, I, I extend that to also show respect to the person who's done the signing. So if they've told me, I signed your key, but please don't circulate it, then I respect that. So what I do is essentially, I take that key back onto my key ring, I see that they've signed it, I store a copy of it, and then I strip the signature off the key on my key ring. Because I don't need to have it there, it's not important for me. It's only important for them locally to have my key be valid for them. Right? And in fact, it's good because it sort of, it, you know, makes, it streamlines your key ring. If you have as many keys as I do on your key, and I have something like 1,700 and something keys on my key ring right now, which is way too many. It's a very good idea to go through it at least once every quarter and strip off all the extraneous, like unknown signatures, you know, and like keys you don't need, and people you have no idea how it got there in the first place. You know, it's like in some key block that you sucked in from somebody else and happen to have this extra key for somebody, you know, you don't even know. Um, good question, though. There's another question over here. Yes. What per, uh, the question is, what version of PGP should Unix users be using? Um, version 1.01 .01 of GPG is excellent. There's also now a command line version of 6.5 that comes, um, and you can get you can download it from the Norway site, which I recommend, uh, which is www.pgpi.org, I think it is. Um, that's, there are Unix versions right there, so th those are the best. The GPG 1.01 .01 is probably the best. It's, it has a little fin finicky problems, but it's getting better all the time. And if anybody's not aware, it's the, really the, the main uh, open PGP implementation at this point. There are some other really nice ones like MUD and MU and some other you know, Japanese versions and stuff like that. They're all good, but GPG is generally considered to be a good you know, benchmark standard for Unix users. And you can recompile your own version, and you can add features. I don't necessarily recommend tinkering with the innards of PGP too much, because you can break things that you don't even know you've broken. But GPG is kind of cool if you want to tinker, yeah? Has GPG been reviewed by people? Yes, absolutely. There's an ongoing discussion about it on PGP users, which is a list that we maintain at CryptoWrites, which is I don't know, it's got some thousands of people on it. It's been going for years and years and years. And it moved over from the old site at rivertown.net, but it's now at CryptoWrites. Um, you can go there by going to cryptowrites.org slash pgp users, and you'll see all the URLs for you know signing up and all that. Um, there's uh, ongoing review on alt.security.pgp. Uh, there are various lists, cryptography at c2.net, coderpunks at toad.com, cypherpunks at cyberpass.net. Lots of people on there uh, are talking about PGP. And if anybody's going to notice a problem, it'll probably come out first on alt.security.pgp or on coderpunks, one of those places. Um, and there are problems found time to time, and they do get introduced into bug reports, and they do get fixed pretty quickly. 
quickly. So, for example, uh, when NAI, uh, I was actually there at the time, NAI released a version of PGP 602, and it had this horrendous bug in PGP disk, which is a commercial product. Um, it was so bad that we released the, the next version of PGP. Uh, we made it freeware temporarily, and we included PGP disk just so everybody would definitely get an upgrade of the copy because it was generating like non-random keys. It was truly a bad bug, and it was a really dumb mistake on the part of the engineer who made it, and he apologized, and they, all the right things were done, so everybody should have that fixed version. But I mean, if there's a problem with PGP, it's much more likely to be found and made public than with almost any other that you know type of communication security. Software. Any other questions? Do you have time for one more question? It's 6.03 now by my clock. I'm totally willing to keep talking if anybody wants to listen. So, yeah. Okay. Oh, never mind. No. <laughs> Who's the next speaker? Well, that's a good question. Are you the next speaker? Yes, I am the next speaker. Come on up. Um, okay. Thanks very much for listening. Um, my email address is. Not on the first slide, but oh, uh, uh, you can reach me at ddt at cryptolights.org. Um, you can also reach me at ddt at meconomy.com. That's economy with an M in front. And yes, we're hiring. And yes, you should come talk to me. Um, or you can send mail to ddt at lsc.com. Oh, I have a fun thing to announce. The RSA patent is expiring on September 20th of this year. Yay! This means that a particular company which never should have gotten a patent on this particular algorithm in the first place is now going to have to give it up. One of the fun things that we're doing is we're going to have a big RSA patent exit party to which we invited Jim Bidzos to come and be roasted. And we think he might even come, and it'll be really fun. And we're going to have it um, from probably 9 o'clock in the evening until 12.01 a.m. on the 20th of September, which I believe is a Tuesday. And it's going to be somewhere in the Bay Area. And if you want to find out more info on this, send email to rsa at lsd.com. <laughs> And we will put you on a list and we'll email like thousands of people with the info on where to go well in advance since September 20th. Just to sort of remember that date because it's really significant. Thanks. It's been cool. Good questions, by the way. You, you definitely don't ask newbie questions. I appreciate it.